I always keep on saying, but this is going to be something interesting in the sense you are going to help someone make a difference to someone's life. And how do you do that? In times of emergency, especially. So that is the beautiful part of, about uh, this section. So this is about the usage of echocardiography in emergency. So there are a lot of emergencies I'm sure you all would have heard, which you all keep on coming across for which you are called upon as well in the emergency room. So what are some of the common emergencies for which you may come across? So one of the first ones is about cardiac tamponade. So what really happens during the cardiac tamponade is, as you all know, it is a life-threatening and process of uh, emergency. So during that, what happens? There is compression of the heart due to accumulation of the fluid or whatever fluids are there, like the pus, blood, or even gas as well sometimes happens. Why? Maybe due to the inflammation of the surrounding structures, trauma, a rupture of the heart, or even aortic dissection as well. So what are the common causes for that? So there are some infective causes. There are some other causes as well. Infective like tuberculosis, pericarditis as well, or even cancer itself can cause this tamponade. So how do you know this? So what are the features for that? So uh, you notice patient has hypertension, tachycardia, they are muffled heart sounds. You may also come across the patient is having pulses paradoxes, electrical alternance on the ECG, and also the cardiac cell halter, when you do an X-ray, will be diffused. It will be slow, accumulative effusions you may come across over there. So what is basically the role of echocardiography? So on the echocardiography, not only you become sure of the diagnosis, you also can have an estimation of the effusion size. Is it less than 10, 10 to 20, or more than 20? Where is the location as well? In which uh, part, for example, is it localized to anterior wall, inferior wall? Was it somewhere else as well? And how about the hemodynamic impact? Because on the basis of that, that is the time you will have to take those decisions. You should be doing it quickly or what or how should you be proceeding? And then not just diagnostic, so it has a therapeutic role as well. So what is the therapeutic role is? You can help guide the pericardiosynthesis. So, and then uh, on the echo, what are the signs? If you see them, you will be knowing that, yes, the patient is having cardiac tamponade. Will be, if you see there is swinging movement of the heart. Otherwise, there is early diastolic collapse of the right ventricle. So this is a little bit confusing, but don't forget, okay? Early diastolic collapse for the RV and late diastolic collapse for the right atrium. So it is opposite, okay? Late diastolic collapse for the RA and early collapse for the RV, okay? Early for the ventricle. Early is not for the atrium. Remember it like this. That's what I used to remember. And then, whenever you see there is exaggerated respiratory variation. So how do you define that? If there is more than 25% variation in the mitral inflow velocity. So this is how you notice over here. So what do you notice over here is, on the right side there is diastolic, not during systole, diastole, so during the relaxation time. If there is an RV collapse, it is a sign. Similarly, what do you notice over here? So this is the cardiac cell halte over here, for example, in during the echo, but there are all these accumulations of fluid around the heart. And that is what is leading to cardiac tamponade. Then, what is the reason for doing an echocardiography in times of acute coronary syndrome? What is the usage for that? So what tends to happen is, when you did an ECG, but you are really suspicious, ECG seems fine, or especially in the very earlier uh, times, I would say, uh, when the process of ischemia has, is just about to involve, so it will take some time as well, during those conditions, echo is one of the most sensitive markers so you will start appreciating those changes acute coronary syndrome on the echo first 
ECG as well, it might take some time. The hyper acute phase, you know, it might take some time for that. So, and even for the unstable angina as well, otherwise, yes, a uh, lot of times you may also rule out the false negatives, you know. So, it is, but yeah, sometimes it may be a false positive as well, because if the patient is having ischemia since a long time back, so we, that's the reason you should never depend on a single clinical parameter, not just only one thing. So you must be able to do that using different multiple parameters for the uh, confirmation of the diagnosis of emergency situations, especially something like acute coronary syndrome. So in the findings, coming to the findings, what do you see in the findings? So over there, you see is, you may see wall motion abnormality may be there, systolic functions, maybe deranged cardiac rupture, uh, papillary muscle or rupture, even ventricular septal rupture, or even the aneurysms may be seen over there. So as we see in this echo, there's not only pericardial effusion, but also there is a rupture over here. So what is happening over here? So what, this is more of a, so in this uh, chamber, what do we see over here? There is discontinuation of the posterolateral wall. Okay, same patient. But later on, we know clinically, so it was a hemopericardium. So these are some of the other views as well. It will give you a better idea what is happening in what segment as well. And yes, you may always try to use the Doppler uh, for your confirmation as well. It always helps you in fact. So then same way you can notice it over here, isn't it? So this, this discontinuation over here. Ventricular septal rupture is there after the myocardial infarction and you can also quantify this. So how much is it? So these are the other images as well. So these images are very important. We should come back to these slides and try to have a look as well. What is happening? So these are those images which are showing. So for example, you should be able to see as well. How does it look like actually? So for example, if there is a papillary muscle rupture, how does it look like? So do you remember in the echo, in the short axis view, you may also notice those papillary muscles in view. So you will be seeing, they will not be so stable in fact. And of course, patient will be having those symptoms. So that's why I always say it like this, you should uh, not never depend upon a single uh, uh, test or something. After half an hour. Just a second. So in the meantime, you can go through the images over here. Just a second. Okay. So these are the other images as well. When you are trying to have a look for the papillary muscle rupture, how do they look like? Um, yeah, I'm so sorry. I couldn't get those uh, moving images, but I think if you go to the YouTube, you can get a lot of those images as well. You can try to have a look. So papillary muscle rupture, then you put up a Doppler, and then you start noticing all these changes further. Then what about the other structural abnormalities which you may notice over in these conditions? So something for the LV aneurysm and even if the patient is having thrombus. So what do you notice in this image actually? Anyone wants to try? What is happening over here? So what is happening over here? So there is aneurysm, isn't it? This, this 
part over here. So this is the aortic region. This is the aortic region. This is this is the aortic cusps and all. And but what do you notice over here? The segment is almost ballooned out. In fact, but this segment, what is happening? So this is what is called a pseudo aneurysm. So pseudo aneurysm, what happens is if if the walls the so what are the walls of the artery, arterial wall? What are the walls of something is called as true lumen, false lumen, tunica media, adventitia, intima. Intima is the innermost layer. And those are the other two layers as well. So how do you notice or diagnose aortic dissection on the basis of echocardiography? So what you do is, so you will be seeing there is a complete obstruction of the false lumen. And there is central displacement of the intimal calcification. And there is separation of the intimal layers from the thrombus and shearing of different wall layers during the aortic pulsation. So how do you, so what are the criteria? How do you differentiate the true lumen and the false lumen? Because if you will be knowing the true lumen, and that's all you will be knowing as well. So what happens is, for this, if you notice systolic in expansion and diastolic collapse, so it will be true lumen, isn't it? However, if you are not able to see any spontaneous echo contrast or if you are able to see systolic forward flow, then it is again a true lumen. False lumen, as you may notice over here, so we have summarized all this criteria. So further, the aortic dissection can be of different types, 1, 2, 3, A, B, on the basis of Stanford classification or DBAK classification. Although, the best one is said to be TE, actually. So when you are trying to observe for this patient in the past on long axis view, it's already written over here. So, so you notice over here something is called as the flap. So even over here, when you're trying to see it during the different cardiac cycles, this is the flap which you notice. Now in the different segments. So that's why not just different modalities, you should use you should also use multiple views as well. You should not limit your whatever you are observing to a single view, in fact. So when you are noticing all these flaps, yes, and over here, so you have tried to put up the Doppler and then you try to see across the flow. So that's why this is true lumen and this is the false lumen. Another lot of times a common question comes as how to differentiate between the pericardial effusion, pleural effusion. Anyone wants to tell how do you differentiate between the two? How can you differentiate between the two? Pericardial effusion of course will be more closer to the heart. So that's the next layer in fact. And pleural effusion is slightly away because it's for the lungs, right? So this is what you notice over here. The layer which is immediate next to the heart is the pericardial fluid and after that is the next one is the pleural fluid actually. Oh, so any questions you guys are having so far from the previous sessions about the echocardiography actually. How many among you all are doing echocardiography actually? Because this interaction is very important. See, echocardiography, if you really want to master it, the best way is to do it more. More you do it, you'll be getting used to those uh, views more and you'll be able to understand it more and more actually. Can you guys hear me actually? Yes, sir. Hmm. 
So how many of you are doing echoes on a regular basis? No one is doing echoes? Okay, one person. How about others? Okay, Hussain is doing. That's great to know. What about others? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Doing. Only Hussain? Sudhir. Sudhir, sir. Sudhir. Sudhir, good. So, Sudhir, yes. you are in which year now? Uh, first, complete. Second semester, sir. Second semester. First, yes. Okay, so do you quantify, uh, do you see... Sir, one, uh, sir one, one problem is there. Yes. Uh, actually, diastolic function, uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo and normal one. Yes. I cannot differentiate. Uh, can you explain one side? Okay, so yesterday I think we had already... Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the slides? Did you go through the slides or not? Yes, yes sir, yes sir. Uh, so what did you go through? Uh, sir, uh, actually, that not uh, clear that mm. concept. That's so, right. So, so, which center are you enrolled at? Where are you based at? Uh, Kalra Hospital, Delhi. Delhi, Kalra Hospital. Yeah. Okay, let me see. I'll try to get it for you. So, yes, this was the slide. Yes, so, what happens is. Yes, sir, yeah. So what will you be noticing as we will try to go through slide itself, you can see everything. Yeah. So what do you notice over here? Yes. Both hearts are looking same. Exactly. Like same. Good. Both are looking same. But what did I say? So you should do some Valsalva maneuver. Okay. So whenever in doubt, when you do a Valsalva maneuver, then you okay. again try to remeasure the E and A. So then what do you notice? What has happened over here now? So in the pseudo normal, both of them have fused. Okay, single wave pattern. Huh? So see, like single wave pattern. See, in the mitral inflow, as I was telling you, so normal, the normal will look like the pseudo normal. That's why it is called a pseudo normal. But if you have done some Valsalva maneuver and all, so then what is going to happen is the normal diastolic function will not change. But the pseudo normal function, the EA will change. Can you see it over here? I'm moving my mouse over here. Yes, 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 sir, yes, sir. Exactly. And the ratio also, the so then of course the E becomes smaller, A becomes larger. Okay. Yeah? Yes, so that is the first yes, thing. Sir, yes, sir. Second thing. Okay. So there are other ways as well to see. So what are the other ways is? First thing is Doppler tissue imaging as well. So at the mitral annular motion, when you're trying to use a Doppler as well, you'll be noticing the changes. What is the changes is E and E prime, the ratio will be less than 10 if it is normal. Okay. okay. But okay, sir. if it is pseudo normal, what do you see over here? The ratio is yeah. okay. more than 10. Isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Similarly, so what will happen is when you try to see for the left ventricular compliance so the left ventricular compliance will be normal in okay. normal heart but the compliance will be decreased in pseudo normal then similarly if you can check also for the atrial pressure the atrial pressure is going to be normal for the normal heart but the atrial pressure is going to be raised for the pseudo normal. Uh, pseudo, okay, okay. Right, sir. right. Okay, sir. So I hope is it clear for you now? I hope is it clear for you, right? So no further doubts. Okay. Any more? Any more person? Any more doubts or confusion or points?
Hello? Are there any more doubts actually today? If there are no more doubts, today we'll finish a bit, little bit earlier. Hello? Hello?